Right, so I'm not Chi Jen or I'm not Praneeth, so by elimination, I'm the third author there. Um, so this is a talk about non-convex optimization. This is the heyday of non-convex optimization. People like a lot and others have really opened this up. Um, and non-convex optimization is all about geometry meets dynamics. Um, so the geometry is how, do you, how much stuff do you have to get through on the way there, what do the trajectories look like, and how does that scale as a function of dimensionality. Um, so if you're starting to talk about geometry meets dynamics, this concept of acceleration really is very important. Because acceleration, in some cases, can meet these lower bounds, oracle lower bounds. So somehow they're doing the right thing with respect both to the dynamics and the geometry. Um, so what about non-convex case? Can we really start talking more about uh, not just Lipschitz gradients and, and so on, the, the simple form of geometry, but more serious geometry involves things like saddle points and other singularities. OK, so here's a little picture just to remind you. Accelerated gradient ascent hops along faster. Um, it goes as 1 over F square root of epsilon iterations instead of 1 over epsilon. Uh, and we like to transfer that sort of think, uh, the, it, uh, thinking to the uh, non-convex case. Is it still faster than GD? Uh, how much faster? And can we do this with really simple algorithms where we don't have to start to use Hessians even though we're trying to work with more complicated geometry? Um, all right, so here is uh, one way of writing Nesterov's uh, accelerated gradient ascent. Um, so it's uh, as if you're taking the gradient at a look-ahead point and, um, and doing gradient ascent from there. Um, so uh, uh, we would like to understand what kind of uh, uh, convergence rate it has in this non-convex setting. Okay, so uh, gradient algorithms in general, or it's not the, the first sort of stage of analysis is to talk about conversions to stationary points. But they can be local minima, they can be spurious local minima, they can be local maxima, and they can be saddle points. We'd like to distinguish among those. Uh, so in particular, saddle points are really where a lot of the geometry starts to be interesting. And uh, it's increasingly realized that in high dimensional uh, non-convex problems, there's lots and lots of saddle points. There may not even be so many local minima, there may even be uh, one global minima, but there still might be a large or even exponential number of saddle points. Um, so we're going to be focusing on one aspect that simplifies, which is that the saddle point needs to be strict, that there is at least one eigenvalue which is strictly negative, otherwise the thing is extremely flat and it's hard to think about saying anything without going to yet further higher order uh, methods. Okay, so the way to start to distinguish between um, different kinds of singularities, let's go to one step further, uh, second order of stationary points. So we're going to ask that the gradients vanish, but we're also going to ask that uh, Hessians be uh, positive, semi-definite. Um, and so as many of you know, many of you are in the room who've been working on this, um, there are problems where they are non-convex, but there are no spurious local minima, and all the saddle points are actually provably strict, so it's a really interesting class of problems. Um, if gradient methods can be applied to here, we can get rates, we can really start to have a real library. Okay, so the setup here is going to be uh, just sort of the minimal smoothness assumptions. We're going to have uh, gradient Lipschitz. So there's a parameter L for that, and we're going to have Hessian Lipschitz. There's going to be a parameter rho for that. Um, if the Hessian were to move around too quickly around the saddle point, it'd be sort of, it would be hard to say much. So we're uh, crucially relying on that assumption. Um, and so there's your second order stationary point again. Gradient advantages, um, positive semi-definite Hessian. Um, and we're going to relax that to an epsilon ball so we can talk about convergence rates. So we'll do this for every epsilon around the, the optimum. Um, and this is the standard Nesterov uh, parameterization of the uh, eigenvalue. Let it be slightly negative again, parameterized by epsilon, then multiplied by the Lipschitz constant. Okay, so here's the background result. This is for, for, for uh, convergence of a form of perturbed gradient ascent, so no acceleration yet. Okay, so we haven't, we haven't gotten there yet. Um, so uh, uh, this paper in 2017 uh, showed that the convergence rate looks just like gradient descent. So it's 1 over epsilon squared. Uh, just depending on Lipschitz constant, and the tilde there is dimension dependence, and that paper was able to show it's polylogarithmic, so logarithm to the fourth power. Um, so if you put that side by side with Nesterov's classical result, uh, it looks essentially the same up to this dimension dependence, which is polylogarithmic. And so that's really about the best you can help for. I do believe it's actually logarithmic, not the four, but um, it, you know, it, it, it's, it has to, there has to be some dimension dependence, and it's, it's pretty minimal. Um, and the proof technique here is pretty interesting. Uh, in some sense, this is just geometry. It's serious differential geometry. And perhaps because none of us uh, have maybe that much skill at differential geometry, this is a probability proof. So you, it's a coupling argument. You start out two diffusions 
um, uh, in, in and about a region uh, which we call the stuck region, where if you're in that region, you're going to take a long time to escape from the saddle point. If you're out of the region, the power method will kick you out quickly. Um, and so you want to start these two diffusions close enough such that they either are attracted to each other or they break apart, and there's a phase transition at some point that tells you how thick that region is. Uh, and so you don't have to replace that region with a slab and you get a bad dimension dependence. You can let the region actually vary spatially according to how the Hessian is varying. Uh, and that allows you to get this logarithmic rate instead of just a polynomial rate. Okay, so now let's turn to acceleration in the non-convex setting. Um, there has been a little bit of work. Uh, there really should be a lot more because, again, this really starts to isolate the geometry meets dynamics. Um, so for first-order stationary points, uh, there's work by Gadami and Land showing that you're at 1 over epsilon squared. But we don't, we're not satisfied with first-order stationarity. Um, you also can start to introduce nested loop algorithms where you have acceleration inside of an outer loop. Um, I hesitate to call those acceleration methods. I mean, if you put Newton inside of uh, interior point, you get a very different, it's not a Newton method anymore, okay? Um, uh, but anyway, you can start to now see that for first order stationary points, you can get a faster rate. It's epsilon to the 1.75 in this paper by Carmon et al. And then that was uh, pursued by others. So you can get one, epsilon to the 1.75 um, for second order stationary points if you allow yourself a Hestian vector algorithm. Okay, so we'd like to simplify and stay with something close to just pure accelerated gradient ascent. We don't want the nested loops. Uh, we'd like to avoid them in practice because that's what real practitioners uh, do. And we'd like to ask, is it still possible to, to, to beat gradient descent in this non-convex setting? All right, so the challenge, or many, there are many challenges. One of them is that AGD, accelerated gradient descent, is not a descent algorithm. Um, so some of the simple geometric arguments you can make just because of things being a descent algorithm, you can't do anymore. Uh, and so a key aspect of this analysis and this style of thinking is, is that you don't just work with the function values, you work with a Hamiltonian in a phase space. Um, and I've got to show one slide here from another, lifted from another talk, uh, highlight Andre, who I believe is in the audience here, Aisha Wilson and Mike Betancourt. We've been working now for a f now several years on uh, going to continuous time to try to understand acceleration methods. And I actually think that's critical. If you're talking about how fast can you go, if you're just thinking about hopping along a discrete set of points, it doesn't really make a lot of sense to say, I'm going faster along those discrete set of points. You need an underlying topology which embeds a flow of time. So you really need to think about continuous time. So this isn't just like OD approximations kind of make limits easier and all that. This is really fundamental algorithmically as far as I'm concerned. You need an underlying flow of time. So you need to th think about these things in a continuous time situation. Um, so we did this variationally, first of all, then in, with a Hamiltonian perspective, and finally a symplectic perspective and a sequence of papers. This is another slide bar from that which I'm not going to get into, but just to show you what these kind of Lagrangians or Hamiltonians look like. Uh, they are kind of physics-style Hamiltonians, but they're all time varying because we're doing optimization instead of classical mechanics, and it's just kind of Euler Lagrange. So you get a differential equation at the bottom, which is an acceleration differential equation that can be studied for its mathematical properties, and it has a number of differential geometry properties. For this particular uh, simplified setting, uh, uh, Euclidean geometry and so on and so forth, uh, all of that machinery reduces to a simple second order ODE, shown right there. Um, and you can simply just do a little bit of physics on that. You can multiply that thing by x dot and you can integrate, use fundamental theorem of calculus and you get that result right there. So you see that the thing, uh, the f plus this one half x dot squared, um, is looking like a thing which is going to be uh, essentially a descent algorithm. So measured using that now Hamiltonian, um, you can have a descent step for at least the convex case. Um, so this is the ha a simplification of the Hamiltonian that I showed you on the previous slide, which was in full generality. Okay, so um, if that's the challenge, the solution is to work with this Hamiltonian. Um, and it turns out that, that uh, AGD and the non-convex case is not quite a descent algorithm yet, but we made progress. Much of the hardness of the thing has been captured by the Hamiltonian, so it's almost a descent algorithm. And the little bit left over, which is not descent, you can handle with this idea, which is we borrowed from Carmen on all, of doing a negative curvature exploitation. Um, when the gradient becomes small, you can identify that at that point via assaying the Hamiltonian, and um, you know that you have now a negative component of your Hessian, and you can take a step in that direction and still make progress. Okay, here's an algorithm. I don't want to spend much time on it. It is actually extremely simple. It's gradient descent, that's step four. It's accelerated gradient descent, that's step four and five. 
Uh, it is a perturbed form of this. We know we have to have some form of perturbation or we get uh, poor results, and that's step three. It's a uniform perturbation in this case. And then step six and seven are this negative curvature expo 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 um, exploitation. So you, you, make an, you assay this Hamiltonian, and if, if that statement is true, then you do that. That's, uh, it's a very simple little step. All right, uh, let me not get into this slide. I think I'm running close to my, being out of time here. But you look at all the sort of decision tree of things that can happen. Um, and this Hamiltonian just sort of allows you, because of the descent step, to uh, infer that we are uh, you know, making a certain amount of progress. And then the AG step it alone is just kind of classical uh, localization. All right, so here is the result, um, which is, in fact, that this perturbed form of accelerated gradient descent, so it really is accelerated gradient descent with a, with a, with a perturbation, um, and then this negative curvature exploration, does, in fact, achieve a rate of that's faster than epsilon squared. It's epsilon to the 7 fourths. Um, and everything else there is um, just kind of the Lipschitz constants of the problem. The tilde there again hides dimension dependence, and it is in uh, still polylogarithmic. So in fact, the really mostly the same proof technique with the coupling argument still goes through, uh, just done with this Hamiltonian. All right, so to put these things side by side, um, in the classical strongly convex case, perturbed GD, perturbed AGD have those rates as shown. And really what's happening is there's a condition number, which is L over uh, alpha, which is playing the role of, it, uh, the, of the improvement of shape by HD. And the same thing is happening here. It's just a different notion of condition number. So in fact, uh, that string of Lipschitz constants there with all those powers actually really is a form of condition number. OK, so to uh, conclude. Um, it really is important to get to uh, uh, converge to second order stationary points. That's really uh, major progress um, in the literature. Um, and pure uh, versions of these algorithms, AG and, and GD, can get stuck. Um, uh, but uh, just putting a few simple ingredients together, AGD and a little bit of stochasticity, so it can give you these fast rates. Thank you. Thank you. So if the next Peter can set, set up, uh, maybe one quick question until then, if there's anything. Please. Okay, so do you see, sorry, what? Seven yeah, you see the seven fourths happen in experience. Yeah, experiments, definitely. Yeah, it's real. Um, I mean, there's several ways to get the seventh fourths, as I showed you some of these other algorithms. The Hessian vector, which is a perfectly viable approach, gives you the seven fourths. Um, but no, I, it's, it's real. You know, I, I think it may be, uh, there's no, no lower bound, but it may be, uh, it's, it's lower bound as, as well. If I can ask, there is any hope that this analysis can carry to the stochastic? Uh, uh, if you put problem? all four of these talks together this morning, uh, some ma major th ma ma theorem may be provable. I mean, the previous talk about the complexity of the stochastic case, we, we're aware of that too. We've tried and come up with some problems in the stochastic case. Um, but our form of perturbation is this round ball. Mm -hmm. And the right way to do it is a little bit of stochasticity in different directions over different epochs, more like stochastic gradient. And uh, but again, that's some serious differential geometry together with these diffusions. And sort of the math gets pretty hairy, but it's totally doable, I think. Thank you. All right.